story ever been told, a real story, by the way, true story, than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm sure glad to be with you here this evening at Hillcrest Baptist Church. Very thankful uh, for the visitors that we have. Um, if y'all don't mind, two ministries, would y'all stand up just for a second and let everybody get a good look at you? Yeah. Hey, we, we love you guys and gals, and um, we pray for you, and we are thankful that y'all are able to be at Hillcrest tonight and worship with us. Um, I want to go back to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. Yeah, come on. Come on. We open in the book. We open in the book. I'm talking about the Word of God, alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing right down to the separation of soul and sunder, soul and spirit, right? Revealing the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. Listen to me. How many of you know you wouldn't know your heart without the Word of God coming? Left up to your own, you judge your own heart. You think you're good when you ain't. <laughs> you ain't. You ain't. We need the grace, the undeserved privilege that we have not earned of the Word of God shining its light into our darkness to show us what's real and to bring us out of darkness and into the light. I mean, you know that he said, if you abide in me, you shall not have to walk in darkness. Abide in Him. He is the Word. We abide in the Word of God. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Father, we thank You for the blood of Jesus, and we thank You for the Word of God. We thank You for Your Holy Spirit, God. Without Your Spirit, we could not discern the things that are on Your heart. We could not understand, but You have given us the precious gift of the Holy, 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 Holy Spirit, God, to be with us and in us and to lead us into all truth, to enlighten the eyes of our hearts, to make us know the truth that makes us free. Would you do it again tonight, Lord, as only you can? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this morning, we've been on a series of messages on Sundays that have been about faith walking faith walking. Um, we talked about the significance of faith in our walk with God. It is the hinge um, uh, of our whole lives now, this new life in Christ. It says that the just shall live. We're talking about life and death is right here by faith. By faith. And it says we walk by faith and not by sight. So faith is the very crucible of our, of our walk with God. It is, it is uh, seeing what is unseen. Amen. I ain't never seen him, but I know him. I believe. Amen. And, 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 I, and I know him and I experience him. I see who he is, his glory, what he's like through his son, Jesus Christ. And I, as I behold His glory, I'm transformed more and more into that image as I'm just walking with Him and talking with Him. It's like a father-son relationship. Next thing you know, just like they told me when I was little, boy, you acting like your daddy. Now I'm walking with my new daddy every day. And next thing you know, they just things about me that look like Him because it is Him. <laughs> it's Him. And it's just from, from faith walking. Day by day, walking in fellowship with God. We talked about in the first uh, message of the series, faith over fear. And how the very antagonist, the, the, the opposite, the enemy of faith is fear. Fear. And how if we, don't, if we don't overcome this, we will be paralyzed. We will not be able to walk with God. You can't walk in fear and in faith at the same time. Now there is a sense of courage. There's a sense of saying, man, I'm, I, I'm a little afraid here, but I'm going to trust God and move forward. That's, that's courage, okay? But I'm talking about fear 
that, that, that paralyzes you, that you can't see, you're not in faith, you can't see hope, you can't see something else. All you can see is what you fear. Remember the uh, 12 tribes that went and spied out the land? Ten of them come back and all they saw was giants and fortified cities. But two old boys that God would later call His servants, all they saw was bread. Hey, they said, the giants will be our food. My God, God's with us. The one, don't y'all remember Him parting the Red Sea? You remember that stuff came down from the sky? You remember that water came out the rock? Come on. You remember He swallowed up our enemies behind us? Yeah, these giants are just going to provide provision for us. God's going to wipe them out and what they have is going to become ours and provide for us. Faith and fear. Fear paralyzed the children of Israel to the point that it, it literally delayed faith walking. Continuing to walk with God by faith, it delayed it for 40 years. 40 years. Because fear overcame faith. So we've, we've been talking about this, and uh, this morning uh, we've been in Isaiah chapter 6, and we're talking about faith walking, and this morning we, we uh, had a subtitle, My Eyes Have Seen the King. My Eyes Have Seen the King. You see, Jesus said, follow me. This faith thing is not just in believing ideas, believing principles, it's believing a person. It's seeing a person. And the person that we see is the one that we're walking with. And so we need to see the king as Isaiah saw, right? It said in the day that Uzziah died, the people were devastated because they had a great king for a number of years that had, that had led them to a place of prosperity, peace. There was no war. Come on. Lots of provision. They were able to build up, stock up, have a season of rest and peace. And all of a sudden, this king dies. And so now they're like, man, hey, this is the guy that, that got us to the place of peace and prosperity and power and having a season of, of rest. And they were devastated because he wasn't there anymore. And God says, you got your eyes in the wrong place. I'm about to show you something. It was in their devastation, their loss of their earthly king, that Isaiah saw a revelation of a heavenly king. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated upon the throne. Come on, not pacing and worry because King Uzziah, oh, what am I going to do? I ain't got King Uzziah no more. No, the living king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords was still on the throne. And he needed them to see that. He, they could not stay stuck in this devastation of losing one person. Come on, people come and go, but God remains forever. God is our King. And He works through men and women, and we should honor those that He does. But listen, it's Him. It ain't the man or woman. There's no good thing in me. Paul said there's no good thing in the flesh. If there's anything good happening in me and through me, it's God. It's God. So there he goes on to say, Paul said, who is Apollos? You know, who is Paul? It's God that worked through them both. It's God that did it. Yeah, they, they gave it, uh, God gave us an assignment. We went in His power and did what He said to do by His power. Some sowed, some water. But God gave the increase. God did it all. Not a man. And so... They got a revelation of God's exaltation, Him sitting on a throne. He's holy, holy. And next, with that uh, uh, revelation and seeing how holy and exalted God was, the natural response from a man was, Woe is me. Humiliation. Humiliation. Woe is me, for I am undone. I told you, Isaiah had preached for five chapters, and he had said many times, Woe unto you, woe unto you who do this, woe unto you who say that, woe unto you. But when Isaiah saw the Lord, he said, Woe is me too, woe is me. That is the correct viewpoint of yourself compared to God. I would, I, would, I would venture to say 
that the closer you are to God, the more you are seeing Him, the more you are humiliated. The more humbled you are. It's a natural response to faith walking, walking in step with God. But after his humiliation, after he was humble to a place of saying, man, I'm unclean, man, I, I'm, I'm not worthy to be in his presence, I'm, I'm undone. When his heart got in a place like that of honesty and humility about who he was, God provided pur purification. In his humiliation, God provided purification. There was a, a, a coal, a live coal, by the way. Come on, Jesus ain't dead. A live coal taken off of the altar, touched his lips, and he was purged and cleansed of his sin. Now tonight, as we, as we look into the, the rest of the story, we went through uh, verses 1 through 7, and I just gave you a recap. Now tonight we want to go, I'm going to start back at verse 1, but we're going to cover verses 8 through 13. And the subtitle tonight is, Who Will Go? Faith walking, who will go? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sit, sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another. I got to thinking about this this afternoon. One cried to another seraphim. One seraphim cried to another seraphim. He said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. And I think what came back, Brother Russ, from the other seraphim, Holy, holy, holy. And all they could do was say it back and forth. Over and over again. Taken back by His holiness. Taken back by who He is. Do you know that God is so great we're going to spend an eternity with Him getting to know Him? Why? Because He is unlimited. He is holy. Nothing or no one compares to Him. See, if you hang out with a person long enough, you can get to know everything about them, but not God. He has a never-ending revelation of who He is. His person, His attributes, His character is never-ending. Come on, Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life. It is to know God. The very thing that is going to sustain my soul and spirit for eternity is a never-ending revelation, a never-ending knowing of God. And I think that the first time I catch a glimpse, it's going to put me on my face. Holy, holy. And if I manage to pull my face up and check him out again, and I see a little more of him, I'm going, holy, holy, holy. And I'm going to spend eternity looking on my God. Man, he said, now we know in part, but one day we'll know as we are known. He said, now we see dimly as in a mirror, but one day I'm going to see him. I'm going to see my Lord. I'm going to see my King just as I am seen. Oh, that's the greatest desire of my heart is to know Him. Lord, did we read Isaiah 6? Where are we at? Whew. Verse 3, verse 4. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Somebody said they smelled smoke this morning. Huh? Somebody in the choir said, I smell smoke. You smell that? It might have just been glory. Verse 5, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Come on, is your eye done? Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King. Come on, it starts, In the year that King Uzziah died. Now he says, my eyes have seen the King. The King. The Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken from, uh, with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Verse 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? 
And who will go for us? That's the invitation. Then I said, here am I, send me. That's the presentation. And he said, go and tell this people. That's the activation. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away. And the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it. That's the preservation and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. The holy seed shall be its stump. Let's look at the invitation. You see, if we are going to walk with God, there's no doubt if you walk with Him and know Him, see Him to some degree, we're going to go through the process that Isaiah did. Humiliation, purification, and then what comes next? If you spend time with God, He's going to give you an invitation. God is. He's going to invite you to walk with Him in some capacity. He's going to show you something, reveal His desires in His heart, and He is going to invite you along to get involved in it. So now, after Isaiah has experienced humiliation and purification, come on, after he's experienced humiliation and purification, God sends an invitation. Listen, it says, I heard the voice. I heard the voice of the Lord. Listen to me, you want to hear the voice of the Lord? You go through the humiliation and the purification. You can hear the voice of the Lord. He gets the invitation who says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who will go for us? Why didn't he just say, Isaiah, I see you there. Yeah. I see you there. Why, why, why don't you... Why don't you go? I got something for you to do, Isaiah. Why? Because he wants a willing heart to say, God, send me. I am here. <laughs> See, I can imagine as God sends forth this imitation, he hasn't even given Isaiah a look yet. And so Isaiah then does the presentation. Hey, God, here am I. Send me. Yes, God will grant you an invitation. The Bible says in Ezekiel 22.30, it says God sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. Watch this, it breaks my heart. But I found no one. No one. God is looking for a man. God is looking for a woman. God desires to do things in the earth, and He does it through people. And He is looking for someone. Who shall I send? Who would even dare to go? When He looks today, will He find anyone? Is there one? Is there one that would say, Here am I, Lord. You don't have to tell me the details about where we're going. I'm, I'm committed to you. And I say yes to you. Come on. Was it, who was it that said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully surrendered unto Him? Fully, wholly yielded to the Lord God. What could God do with a man or woman like that? He is extending an invitation and I sought for a man. Come on, men. Come on, men. I sought for a man. I sought for a man who would stand in the gap. 
Come on. A man that would stand. Come on. A man that would stand. In a generation of men who fall for anything, God says, I'm looking for one that'll stand. I got a, a quote in my office at home. It says, a man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. A man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. I tell you what, I want to be a man that stands. And now there's wisdom in standing for things. You know what I mean? Sometimes I've stood, and I might have did it the wrong way, but by God, I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand with God. I'm going to stand with truth. I'm going to stand with what is right. If no one else does, if all of you think I'm crazy, I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand. And that's what God is looking for. 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 21, he says, The solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Come on, remember, He was humiliation and purification. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, purification, from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the Master, prepared for every good work. Listen to me. We, 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 we need not get our zeal ahead of our character. Hey, you may be passionate about doing something for God, but God is far more concerned with character. He's far more concerned preparing you. Come on, you say, God, use me. God, use me. God, give me something to do. God, Lord God, use me in the world. Listen, God is saying, make yourself useful. Make yourself useful. Set yourself apart to me. You cut yourself off from, from worldly influence and, 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 and come aside to be uh, uh, sanctified unto me. Uh, spend some time growing in my likeness. Spend some time where I'm developing character in you. Come on. Go out to the woods first, Rusty, for five years where there ain't nobody there but about four men. And you log and work hard and learn integrity. Learn to show up on time. Learn to work hard for a, for a, for a, a, unto the Lord even though you don't like it. Come on. Learn to be submissive. Learn to be patient. Learn to take orders. You want to be a leader? Learn to follow. Character. Character. 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29. He says, You see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak. Come on. You say, God, I'm weak. <laughs> I'm not a strong person like someone else. That guy over there could lead so much better. He's just got it. He can just do it so good. God, get him. He says, no. I want somebody who knows they can't do it. So that when it gets done, I get all the glory. <laughs> I'm looking for a, a weak vessel. I don't choose the, 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 the biggest, strongest one out my bag and put them out there. I choose a shepherd boy with a sling and a stone to go up against a giant. That's how I roll. That's what I choose. That's the invitation from God. Are you weak? the weak things of the world, to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen. The things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. The things that are despised. Let me show you who God is. You about to play dodgeball? About to play dodgeball? You picking teams? Oh, I want Him. I want Him. I'll take Him. You know that one left that nobody picked? That's who God chooses. I'm drawn to people like that. 
I am drawn to people that, that everyone else thinks they could not do X, Y, Z. I'm drawn to that kind of person. The ones that are a little different, the ones that wouldn't get picked on the dodgeball team, I just got something in my heart that says, let me check this person out because I know how God rolls. He'll take the ones nobody thinks can do it and He'll do it with them. That's what He does. Next, let's talk about the presentation. So, Isaiah says, in light of the invitation, here am I. I don't know why, but I just like saying it like that. The, the New King James and the Old King James says it that way. I just like it. it, it's, it you know, he could have said, here I am. I mean, maybe your Bible does. But I just like it. How, he says it throughout the Old Testament in many places, like, like Abraham called for Isaac, and he says, here am I, Father. Or, or, or God is, is calling to Samuel in the middle of the night and Eli tells him, hey, go back and this time say, you know, uh, I'm here, your servant's listening. So, so he calls his name in the middle of the night and he says, here am I, Lord, your servant's listening. Here am I. Man, here am I. What a simple statement. What a simple statement that means this is my presentation. I, listen, I am undone, is what he said. My eye's done. So what I'm going to do with my eye? Here it is. Here's my eye. Here's me. All of me. Here it is, God. Send me. Send me. Man, I, I wish we knew an old song by Jake Hamilton. I don't know if y'all could handle it. It's, it's almost hard rock. <laughs> but it's Christian. And man... I used to ride in that tractor and God began to call my heart after about five years of being out there. And I used to ride around working on that tractor, working that machine with tears streaming down my face saying, Here am I, Lord, send me. Have you ever had God Work it into your heart as you have known Him and been with Him. You catch glimpses of things He wants to do and He is calling and inviting who will go. I just need a man. I need one. Is there one out there? Do you know that God took one man oftentimes and saved the whole world? Come on. Noah. One man. One man was hearing from God. One man was faith walking. And one man was being obedient. Saved an entire world. Man, what could God do with a church full? Hillcrest Baptist Church. What could He do with a whole body that says, here we are, Lord, send us? Presentation is a choice that we make. Romans 6, 16 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? You and I are making a choice every morning and many times moment by moment throughout the day. We are choosing who we are presenting ourselves to. It's either to sin that is going to lead to death. Come on. It may lead to physical death. But I'll tell you what sin will do. It'll, it'll bring death to a marriage. It'll bring death to a job. It'll bring death to good stuff, man. It brings death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Sin still brings forth death. But we can present ourselves to God to be a slave unto Him, and God can bring forth His righteousness in our lives. Romans 12.1 says, I urge you, brethren, because of the mercies of God. Come on, we sang of His goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Listen, Paul is saying the only response to a revelation of how good he is, it is because of his goodness I'm urging you to present your body a living sacrifice. Holy. It means set apart just for God and no one else. Come on, a mind that is set apart just for God and no one else. A body that is set apart just for God and no one else. 
That's what the goodness of God should lead our hearts to presenting our whole bodies. Where my feet go, what my hands touch, what this body engages in, holy, set apart for God's use. Amen. And he says, he says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Some Bibles translate the word service as worship. Same word. Same word. Come on. We like to worship like this and sing a good song. And this is worship in spirit. Amen. And in truth. But our worship does not just consist of being in this building doing this. Our worship consists of our whole bodies being given unto God. Our whole lives. Come on. Not Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday night. 24-7. Here am I, Lord. You do what you want to do with this body. It's all yours. The presentation. 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, Timothy is telling us, or Paul is telling us, to be careful how we present ourselves. Come on. You, when you say, here am I, send me, you want to have some time. Listen, I'm not talking about waiting until you're perfect to serve God. But I am telling you, you don't want to present this, this person that it, it has no victory in your thought life, still in bondage to, you know what I mean, to different stuff you just can't get free of. Come on. You ain't got no wisdom. Oftentimes you say the right thing, but you say it in the wrong place and cause a big old mess. You don't want to give that to God and say, here, work with this. No, you want to be diligent to present yourself approved unto God. That means instead of saying, God, use me, God, use me, God, use me, and that being your focus, ministry, ministry, ministry. No, it should be make me usable, mold me, shape me, God, humble me and work on me, God. Whatever you got to do, get that thing out of my life, God. Whatever you got to do, shape my character. God, give me wisdom, Lord God. I cannot be or do what you want me to do without you giving to me wisdom. Shape me and mold me, God. That's the kind of person God wants presented unto Him. Next, let's talk about the activation. I'm going to need some more water. <clears throat> the activation. Thank you, brother. So we saw the invitation. Whom shall I send? Who will go? Presentation. Here am I, Lord, send me. Now the activation. Do, do you, do you, do, let, me, let me catch this right here before we move on. Just don't read the Bible too fast. You can't read it too slow. You hear me? But you can read it too fast. Think about that. There's a conversation going on between Isaiah and God. Personal. God spoke. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord. And then I answered the voice of the Lord. And now God is speaking back. And this faith walk is growing and beginning to take shape here. So he says, go. Go, that's the activation. Come on. What did he tell the disciples right before he ascended into heaven? He said, wait. Wait. You tarry. Wait in Jerusalem, until I've sent the promise from my Father that you might be equipped by the power of the Holy Ghost to be my witnesses. And after that, he says, go. Go when you have the power. This is the activation. In John 10, 17 and 18, he said, My Father loves me because I lay down my life. Come on, we, pre we presented ourselves. Here am I, Lord. I lay down my life. He says that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. Come on, they, they didn't kill Jesus. They didn't murder Him. He presented Himself to God. <laughs> he presented Himself a sacrifice. A lamb uh, led to the slaughter. He says, but I lay it down of myself. Watch this. I have power to lay it down, 
and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Listen to me. The power is in the command. When God speaks, do a thing. Go, start this, do this. That is the activation. That is the power that is needed for the thing to come about. Jesus said, I've got power to lay my life down and take it up again. Why? Because I received a command. A command from my Father. Do you know that it took power for Jesus to lay His life down? Have you ever thought about that? Sure, we think about it took, it, it took power for Him to be raised. Do you know it took Jesus' power? He needed power to lay it down. Listen, God will give you His Spirit, and His Spirit will enable you, will give you power to deny yourself, lay yourself down, and power to walk and follow Him. It says in Hebrews 1.3, as it speaks of the Word of God, we're saying the power's in the command. It says in the middle of the verse, he says, He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. This translation says, He upholds all things by the Word of His power. Come on. Come on, Peter. You're crazy. You can't walk on water. It is not possible. Scientifically, physically, whatever you want to say, you can't walk on water, Peter. Yeah, yeah, but I got a command. <laughs> he, he, he said one four-letter word, C-O-M-E, Jesus. The one who spoke the world into existence. The one who hung the stars and, and counted them. The one who, who spoke the world right where it should be and stayed the right distance from the sun. And this thing never gets off and we don't just fling off out there and be destroyed. No, it's being held by the command that was given. That one said something to me. And I know it's impossible, but the power's in the command. So he walked on water. See, the power is in the Word. When God speaks a thing, He upholds you by the command, by the Word of His power. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, church, we have already been given a command. Already. He says to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. Activation. The power's in it. Go, therefore. Make disciples of all the nations. Come on. He didn't say make professing church members. Come on. He didn't say uh, build bigger and bigger buildings until you just got a bunch of names on the roll. And, and No, no, no. He said make disciples. Discipline learners, those who lay down their lives to learn of Jesus and follow Jesus. That's what I want you to make. Don't make people that just come down here and repeat a prayer after you one time. And then they get baptized, but you don't see them no more. No, you make disciples. Disciples. And when you're making disciples, then you baptize those. You baptize those who have yielded truly to the Lordship of Christ, who their heart is not just said, I don't want to go to hell and I need Jesus' forgiveness. No, their heart has said, I'm giving all of me to Jesus. I'm not just asking for Him to come into my heart. I'm asking Him, take all of me, Lord. Come on, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the true gospel, by the way, that is so often missed. The Lord, He's making disciples. And He says, baptizing them in the name, that's the power, that's the authority, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, come on, teaching them. Do you know that word right there is the same word in Hebrews when the Bible says He chastens those He loves? It's not just giving information to people. It's not just reading Bible verses to them. It's reading Bible verses to them and making sure they understand, listen, do you realize that you've given your heart to the Lord Jesus? And so He teaches us to watch the way we dress. To be modest in our clothing. Come on. 
Let's just talk about some of the nuts and bolts of the real stuff of walking with Jesus. Do you realize you've given yourself to the Lord Jesus? And, and I'm reading Scripture here to you that says, you should do your work unto the Lord with all your heart, not to men. You should not be coming to me, complaining to me about your boss and what they did to you and who treated you unfairly. You should be yielding to God, and if God gave you that job, you should work unto Him. And come hell or high water, your peace is not taken by what man does to you. You have peace because you know you and the Lord understand one another. Teaching people. It, it involves correcting. It involves helping them see, no, you're seeing this off. This is what Jesus says. Amen. It even involves if people just continue to buck and buck and rebel against the command of the Lord Jesus to say, man, I love you so much, but you've chosen your sin. You've chosen your sin and we've done all we can to talk with you. We've done all we can to counsel you. and We love you. We're for you and not against you. But our Lord says to put you out that you might learn not to sin. To give you over to Satan and the sin you have chosen that you might learn. You might learn not to sin. Come on. That's what my Bible says. How many churches are really operating by the Bible? Listen, if you, if, if you live by the Word of God, this is, what, this is what the Bible promises. All those who desire to live godly, they'll suffer persecution. Listen, we know, we know the borders. We can be political. I know what I can and can't say, and everybody will still be good with me. I know what our church can and can't do, and we, everybody in the community won't ever say any bad word about us because we don't want that. We don't want anybody to ever say anything but good about Hillcrest. Listen, woe unto you! when they always speak good of you. For so they did the false prophets. But blessed are you if you are persecuted for my namesake, my character, who I am and what I am like. Great is your reward in heaven. Come on. That's what he says. And God has given us this word, church. We're not waiting on it. He has said, go. There is activation. There's power in the command. All we have to do is present ourselves to it and we can be activated and go forward. And last, let's talk about preservation. Preservation. you got to understand. you got to understand that for a period of time, the people had gotten right with God for a period of time, King Uzziah was seeking the Lord. He was God's man. He was. He was seeking the Lord. And he was doing things God's way. But King Uzziah, when he became powerful, pride crept in. Come on. Man, it's a sneaky thing. It can happen to you and you, you, can't, you don't see it. You can't tell it. Listen, that's why you need your good wife. They'll say, you don't, you don't see what I'm seeing, but you need to hear this. Amen. That, that loves you and that'll keep you from getting too boosted up in pride. You need some good brothers. Come on, Harrison. You need some brothers that, that, that aren't just about making you feel good, but that'll tell you the hard stuff when you need to hear it. Because they don't want you to be given over to pride. But he had given himself over to pride, and in doing so, the people, come on, as the leader goes, so grows the people. The people began to turn back around and go the other way from God. And so what does God do? He sends prophets in, warn them, give them the word, tell them to turn around, knowing that they're not going to hear, they're not going to listen, but he's still gracious enough. He, God will always give you an opportunity. He will. He'll come to you and He will give you His Word about where you are and you're going to make a choice. And when you suffer because of your sin, it's not because God is necessarily punishing you. 
even though He does chasten those He loves. But listen, chastening and punishment only comes because of your choice. <laughs> Amen. My kids tell me sometimes that, I, that I'm mean when, when I have to discipline them. Cole used to, when you was younger, Cole, you don't do it no more. You, you, you've gotten better about that. But Cole used to say, you're mean. He had tears in his eyes. I'd be whooped. He'd say, you're mean. No, I love you. And this don't feel good to me. I don't want to ever have to discipline you. But I love you enough and I'm going to teach you the right way. I'm going to teach you the right way. Come on. He says uh, in Hebrews that it proves when we are chastened by God, when a group of people is under God's judgment and chastening, it proves that they belong to Him. But it says the one that God does not discipline, they are illegitimate. They do not belong to Him. Come on. If you can sin successfully and keep right on going in it, you might want to think about whether you're truly saved or not. Because a child of God, if you go headlong into rebellion and sin against God, you're going to wind up in a hog pen somewhere. It ain't going to be successful. There will be an end to it. God will bring it to a stopping point. He will hedge your way in with thorns. And He'll give you a moment and He'll pour His Word into you and say, wake up! Here's the truth! Turn around! Thank you, Christian Family Center. Thank you for those six months, God. Thank you, jail cell. Thank you, police. You're the good guys. I was the bad guy. I was the one sinning. Thank you. You are God's instrument for righteousness in my life. God used you to correct me to turn me away from sin and, and point me back towards righteousness and walking with you. God desired to preserve this people even though He had to judge them for their sin. Come on. God will not just let it go on and on and on and on and on and on. He's too good for that. He's too good for that. So He had a preservation. He said a tenth will be in it and will return. My Bible here says... In uh, verse uh, 13, a little note on my Bible says, the tenth refers to the remnant which returns from exile and remains true to God. See, what would later happen is they would go into exile, Babylonian captivity. The whole temple and everything they had got shut down, destroyed came to nothing. They lost the promised land. They lost all of the good things God had blessed them with. And they went into captivity. I think for, uh, for 70 years, for 70 years. But God had a hope and a future for them. Jeremiah 29, 11, right there in the middle of that, He said, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There's a remnant of you. I'm going to preserve I'm going to preserve and save. You remember, he did this through the life of Joseph. Can y'all handle a little more? I don't, there's just fire in here tonight. I don't even know how long I've been preaching. I can't hardly... I, I need water. You hear me? You know what I'm saying? If anybody needs to go right now, it's me. But I'm going to stay. Are you going to stay with me? All right. So, so you remember, this is what we see in the life of Joseph. It says in Psalm 105, verse 16 and 17, says he called for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply. Then he sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. See, God had him a man picked out. And, and he was about to judge his people, but preserve Many alive, we would see later. He had a man set up for preservation. And this is what Isaiah was sent to do. He said, when you go, it's going, they're going to hear but not hear. They're going to see but not see. And they're not going to understand. But I have preserved a tenth, a remnant, who will come back to me. Imagine that, Harrison. God says, okay, you want full-time ministry? You're going to go preach and nobody's going to listen to you. You're going to present your whole self to me. And you know what ultimately is going to happen to you in, in the end? You're going to be sown in half for my namesake. That's what happened to Isaiah. History tells us. 
His ministry was full of preaching and warning and loving His very own people and them being hard-headed, stubborn, and would not listen. Sometimes I get discouraged, Brother Richard. Sometimes I love people, but God's love in me, and I love them, and, and, and God pours so much on them, and then one day they just decide to turn around and go back the other way. And you know what they'll do sometimes, Brother Richard? They'll blame me for it. Yeah, they'll somehow say that, uh, well, preacher, you didn't do this or that for me. You didn't, and they'll blame me for it. That's my ministry sometimes, Brother Russ. Matter of fact, that's my ministry a whole lot more than it is the good stories. Yeah. But you know what keeps me going? It's the tenth. It's the remnant. It's the remnant. When I'm, when I'm loving them, they're loving me back. When I'm preaching to them and teaching them, they're telling me later, this is what I got. And because of, because of the Word that God gave you and you gave to me, this is how it has changed me. There's a tenth, Brother Russ. There's a remnant. We got to fix our eyes on the remnant, man. On the ones that are getting it. On the ones that are responding and, and preserve a tenth for the Lord. Joseph, Genesis 45, 6 and 7 it says, for the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by great deliverance. So Joseph said, here am I, send me. He said, okay, pit, prison, palace. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> And it was years of, of wondering, God, where are you? I didn't sign up for this. But Joseph never turned around. You know why? Because he had a dream. He had a command. I'm telling you, there's power in a word from God. The only thing that has kept me at times is the command. No, 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 I can't quit because God said... God said, I'm hurting, I don't like it, I don't in the flesh choose to continue in it, but because you said it, God, here am I, I'll keep going. And God gives me power. He gives me what I need, because there's power in the command. If you'll trust the command and walk in it, there will always be power there to keep going. And Joseph kept going. He says in chapter 50, verse 20, As for you to his brothers, he said, You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Now listen, watch this. These are people that Joseph had loved, that God had sent him to minister to. They threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. That's how they responded to his ministry. And those same people God brings back before this man and He says, I've chosen you for this moment to preserve the very ones that wronged you, that did evil against you. Come on. How many of us draw lines on people? <laughs> Done with Him. Mm -mm. He better not come back over here. Don't call my phone. Amen. There's times when you have to when you have to say, you know, hey, there's a period of time here you ain't doing right and you you're going the wrong way and I just can't I can't get with you because of your choices. But what if God brought them humbly back to you one day? What would you do after they hurt you the last time you were trying to love them and minister to them? What would you do? What would you do? This is what Joseph said. He said, "I I I see it from God's point of view." You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. As it is this day, he says, he says, to bring about the present result, to preserve many people alive. To preserve many people alive. Brother Russ, if y'all get ready to come. <clears throat> 
who will go who will go walking with God walking with God and I'm on my way to heaven that's sealed that's secured what a day that's going to be but God didn't just save me so that I'd be going to heaven one day he's inviting me on a mission he has saved me and chosen me at this day and this time for such a time as this there is something whether it be being faithful day after day on a job with people who treat me wrong, being faithful day after day in a school of people who hate God, God has chosen me and put me where I am for such a time as this. And He is calling. There is an invitation. Will I yield to His plan or will I, will I complain and just try to take the easy road and just, just bank on my salvation? I'm going to heaven one day, bless God, and I'm going to give the church a couple days a week. No, who will say, here is my I? Here am I. Who will present their bodies a living sacrifice? Because of the mercy that has saved you and secured you for heaven, the only reasonable response from you is that you would yield all that you have to the King, the Lord of hosts. And say, King Jesus, here am I. You command it, and I will go. No strings attached. What if it's something that's going to look unsuccessful like Isaiah's ministry did? What if people were going to say, man, what are you doing? There's not any fruit coming out of this. What if they're going to misunderstand me? What if people I love the most are not going to support me? Matter of fact, what if they're dead set against me and all I want to do is just obey you? Count the cost. Because Jesus said, any man having put his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. He said, count the cost. He said, if you want to follow me, this is what you got to do. Deny yourself. You got to say, here am I. And take up your cross. A cross is a mechanism for death. Take up your cross. Join me in dying to your will that the will of the Father might be done in your life. Take up your cross and follow me. Count the cost. Come on. He said if anyone loves father, mother, sister, brother, children, wife, even his own life more than me. He cannot be my disciple. He didn't say you wouldn't be a very good one. He said you can't even start with me. See, because if you love daddy more than you love God, you'll do what daddy says instead of what God says. If you love mama more than you love God, you'll do what mama says instead of what God says. If you love your wife more than you love God, you do what your wife says instead of what God says. If you love your children more than you love God, you'll do what your children say instead of what... Come on. You cannot go in two directions at the same time. You can't follow man and God at the same time. Come on. God brought Isaiah to the top of Mount Carmel, all of his people, and he said, hey, listen, you're trying to worship Baal and God, and it ain't going to work. He said, how long will you falter between two opinions? How long will you play Christianity and love the world at the same time? How long will you just be banking on going to heaven one day and getting all the promises of God in the promised land, but yet not yield yourself to me fully? How long will you be divided between two opinions? He said, if Baal is God, then follow him. You go all in with Baal if you want to. Don't, don't play around with God and Baal. If you think Baal is God, then follow Him. But if God is the Lord, follow Him. Follow Him. Here am I, Lord, send me.